This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, government agriculture economists lay out the path as they see it for the rest of this year. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to This Week in Agribusiness. It's always a pleasure to be able to join you here. Mr. Pearson, out off the hot trail, where have you been anyway? You know, I have been back and forth. I was up in Fargo at the 7th Annual Northern Corn Soy Expo. A lot of optimism there in the Northern yeah. Great Plains, but a lot of snow. And then I was in Louisville, Max, at National Farm Machinery Show with you last week. Last week. Great crowds. We had a good time there, to Great be sure. Time. You were not at the National Ag Outlook Conference. That's an interesting event that is held every year, early in the year. The government economist, indeed, shared their projections. I think this was the 99th year for the event. Oh, wow. And this year, of course, they took a look at farm income, reflecting back on last year and what's to come in the year ahead. 2022 was a really great year. 2022 was a really great year for farm income. Okay. Got there with a lot of anxiety. Remember, I told you we had incredible volatility on both input prices and output prices. And so you know, when you talk to producers, that produces, that's a lot of anxiety. Where are we going to end up? Okay, when we look forward into receipts in the coming year, those lower commodity prices are going to reproduce lower receipts across the board, but they're coming off of what are pretty high receipts. Okay, so you had pretty high receipts for all those commodities, and in almost all cases for crops and livestock, you're seeing that recede a little bit. USDA Chief Economist Seth Meyer shared his view on exports for the U.S., and he said uh, the strong dollar could be a challenge. One of the things affecting our exports again is, you know, th this graph shows you energy price movements, ag price movements, and the strength of the US dollar. You have seen energy prices begin to recede. You have seen ag prices start to fall. You've seen the dollar remain relatively strong. That does produce some headwinds for us when we think about exports. Those commodities are priced in dollars. The dollar is expensive. It makes folks wanting to buy commodities from us, makes it a little more expensive. So you can observe that within you know, the export market. But on the other side of that, the strong dollar makes US consumers available, able to import certain ag products that they like. Yes, indeed, the dollar, I guess, as you look at it from a U.S. standpoint, is a two-edged sword. Then you look at South America's crop production. It's hard to ignore what's happening with soybeans. That's certainly true. Dr. Meyer highlighted what's coming out of South America this year, but importantly, he looked ahead to what could be coming down the line. When you think forward and you look at the outlook for this, you're talking about a 204 million metric ton crop out of South America in terms of soybeans. Under normal weather, it would have been more like a 210 million metric ton crop. What do you think that crop looks like next year? You know, you're talking something, something in the neighborhood of 220 million metric tons of production somewhere in that neighborhood under a normal weather assumption. That's a lot of beans. So what we've seen is a big rebound in production. This production will come in halfway through our own marketing year of beans. I mean, it's, it's coming in right now in terms of our, our production and then we will see again a larger crop base under normal weather conditions next year. That was Dr. Seth Meyer, chief economist at the USDA. There was a time when they held that Ag Outlook Conference in November and back in those days it spanned five days. It was quite an event then. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag dealer network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit firestoneag.com to find your local certified dealer. Now it's time to talk markets. Joining us this week is Dave Weber, Senior Protein Analyst with Terrain. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. The big theme in 2022 in the cattle market, Dave, was herd liquidation amidst the ongoing drought. As 2023 kicks off, is that trend still in place? It is. We're still seeing cows move, uh, breadstock move out of uh, the Northern Plains, uh, really driven by high hay prices, poor weather conditions, I think a lot of uh, generational turnover, folks looking to retire, that average age of producers helping some folks make the decision just to say, we're gonna let somebody else run this ground and move these cows uh, maybe to some more warmer, at least this winter. Well, and the warm places have all been covered with drought for the past two years. Dave, we've seen the herd liquidate there. Is there any sign that the liquidation is starting to moderate? Well, we're at least starting to see moderate. Last year, we were up about 8% on beef cow slaughter versus the year prior. This year, we're down about 3.3% compared to that, but still up about 5% compared to the five-year average. We're still slaughtering about five, between five and 10,000 head a week. 
um, more than the five-year average. And in my view, that's still a liquidation pace. Yeah. Dave, when we slaughter these, these cows, these animals that are moving from the factory to the, uh, the processing room floor, where does that meat go and what kind of impact is that having on the beef trade? Largely, it's a uh, lean trimmings kind of product going to uh, fast casual dining, fast food outlets, retail grocery stores, those kind of things. Uh, the beef cow slaughter, dairy cow slaughter all kind of ended up in that pile. So has that kept imports of lean trimmings down in 2022? Uh, they, they were down, but it was really just a function of uh, Australian production being off about 40% uh, compared to kind of normal levels. Mm. Uh, so we're not having the, the import volume come and uh, help, dry, help hold up those prices, uh, even with big cow slaughter numbers. All right. Dave, as you think about where this goes from here, we've got those feeder cattle markets getting hot at auctions across the country. For folks out there looking to buy some feeder cattle, they're paying a lot of price in here. How do you manage that risk? Well, I think uh, as we look at the, the, the market really been driven by kind of what that opportunity looks like and everybody's judging it against the, the back end of the futures. If you look at uh, uh, June, August futures kind of driving where those feeder cattle markets go here near term. Um, corn's the biggest other risk in the marketplace. Uh, corn base is still just a huge problem in the, in the southern plains in particular. That's kind of kept a lid on prices. Uh, the other thing that's kind of offset and helped, there's a lot of interest in light cattle. Uh, as we start to see El Nino start to maybe show its wares a little bit and start to see moisture maybe improve, folks getting a little maybe anxious to get cattle bought, maybe ahead. Uh, I think some of the bigger feed yards have been more proactive trying to own some of that younger stock and, you know, trying to find a place to put them is the, the big challenge. Well, if you find a place to put them, then as you mentioned, you got to feed them and corn is still six plus dollars. Dave, where do you see fat cattle prices going as we get through 2023? Is the trend up? It is for the year. Uh, if we look at annual average, probably in the kind of 159 to 60 for the average, which means we've got some downside risk for the summer, and I think a pretty good rally coming back into the fall. Near term, I think we're kind of range bound in this kind of low 160s territory till we get past Easter, and then grilling season will be the real telling um, kind of bellwether for, for demand. As we see retail demand during grilling season take off, we've seen some kind of testing of the, those markets on, on New York strips at the beginning of February. Uh, to record prices. I think retailers are trying to figure out what to do with uh, you know, consumers towards the back end of the year, and we're going to set that up during the grilling season. All right. We've also seen wholesale beef, beef prices accelerate here recently in the past couple of weeks. Dave, is that just retailers getting prepared for the well, grilling season? I think it's uh, partially getting ready for uh, the last couple of weeks. We had pretty good clearance for Valentine's Day, but tighter production. We've been off about 4% during January. We're down a little more than that uh, coming in here to February. I think that uh, kind of regional tightness, especially in the north, you know, cattle not being of the greatest interest by packers just because of the mud uh, conditions on those cattle. So we've seen that uh, demand shift further south uh, from a fed cattle standpoint, but really just tight numbers uh, or tight slaughter numbers. Right. Packer margin's not the best uh, coming into it. Uh, it's kind of kept things tight and, and propped up. All right, those prices are there, folks. Dave Weber will be back for more in just a minute. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. Welcome back. We're talking markets with Dave Weber, Senior Animal Protein Analyst with Terrain. And Dave, we've got to talk about this pork market. There has been incredible volatility over the past three years, and I'm wondering, is it starting to settle down? Not yet. Uh, this week's uh, pork cutout kind of gives us a glimpse into kind of how wild things can be. Uh, really, that big rally on the belly side uh, you know, kind of set everybody back and said, what's well, going on? And then the next day, we're right back to where we were to start with. So, yeah, lots of lots of volatility. I think that continues probably until Pat, do we get past uh, any kind of ruling from the Supreme Court on Prop 12. Yeah, there's some policy issues overhanging. But before we get into that, Dave, I did want to ask you, 2022, from the outside looking in, seemed to be a profitable year for hog producers. But I'm not seeing a lot of construction going on. What's happening with expansion across the country? Expansion has been slow to non-existent. Really, the only improvement we've had uh, from a from a production standpoint is uh, pigs per litter. Mm. Getting back on on track uh, with the, the growth there uh, really, I think, is a, a, a testament to getting labor back in the barns and getting some of that kind of solved. On the south side, though, numbers not getting any better. Producers pretty reticent about uh, any kind of plans to grow at any kind of level. You know, facilities expensive to build, hard to find equipment. Genetics are probably available, 
um, interest rates not helping. And then we got the looming question of do we build a conventional barn? Do we do um, a, a group housing uh, gestation kind of facility? What's going to happen with that? All driven by Prop 12. That's the thing. So that Proposition 12 in California, it's pending before the Supreme Court. Now we should get a decision on it later this spring. What happens if the Supreme Court upholds Prop 12 for the pork industry? Well, we've got uh, a lot of change coming uh, because we're, we're behind schedule on any kind of transition to be compliant. Uh, we don't have enough barns transitioned, enough sows transitioned to meet that. So we're going to have a shortage of, pro of pro if Prop 12 stands. Mm -hmm. We have a shortage of pork in California that's compliant. And then we've got 47 other lower states that uh, have too much pork in them. Okay, so it's going to be an upheaval in the industry. It is. If, if Prop 12 is thrown out, do you expect to see expansion get started fairly quickly? Um, more of a modest pace. I think okay. really driven by those, those factors of what it costs to do it. Um, you know, maybe some doubts on what we could do for exports with, with China, Russia relations maybe warming on that side and us kind of telling China to back off. I think that might have some trade repercussions. We see them warming to Australian beef. Um, they haven't been really excited about doing that uh, until here in this last couple of weeks, making that kind of connect the dotted lines, yeah. um, thinking that maybe they're trying to find some more, more sources of product. Interesting, because China was a big buyer when they were suffering from African swine fever. They stepped back. Do you expect them or does the trade expect them to come back for American pork this year? Uh, modestly. I mean, we'll see some growth uh, in terms of exports, but uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them to be the savior for the, uh, for the pork market. Dave, another theme over the past several years in hogs has been African swine fever. Is the industry still continuing to see that pop up and impact price and availability? Uh, in, in the European market, I think that's probably the, the place where we have the most fear uh, mm. in the marketplace is if something drastically happens, like if you saw it show up in Spain, uh, which would take the rest of the European production out of the out of the mix, uh, that could really drive some export uh, opportunity out of the U.S., Mexico, Brazil. All right. Any other opportunities for upside here in the pork market? Well, I, I don't see a lot um, really driven by the headwinds we're seeing on uh, on the competing meat side. Yes. If we look at what's going on in the poultry business, they've gotten their uh, reproductive problems uh, solved, the hatchery issues solved. Um, big production here in the first quarter, pretty good production in the second quarter last year, or excuse me, the, the second half of last year. And that really has taken breast meat prices in a USDA market down in the, the low $1 kind of territory. We were 350 360 a year ago. Uh, we're going to see some pretty heavy uh, poultry featuring activity as we get into the spring during grilling season. That kind of puts a lid on especially pork loin prices. That's a good point. That's a good point. Competing meats in the meat case, pulling that consumer dollar. Folks, Dave Weber, Senior Animal Protein Analyst with Terrain, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us and appreciate the opportunity. If you need more information, join us at uh, terrainag.com. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Well, as Chad joins us this week, it's not a piece of equipment that goes across the field or something that flies across the field. He's taking a look at software that can help growers in an increasingly complex business. You know, when I talk to farmers, it's easy to get frustrated about how they stay on top of their business. There's so many things changing, so many moving targets, especially when you start integrating all the different systems on your farm, regardless where that layers of technology come from. On this week's show, we're gonna to talk to a guest who's specializing in some unique software that might help a farmer do this. Paul, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've recognized from farmers in a solution you're working on. All right, Chad, happy to. So what we're working on, we started back last year around July and basically came from a conversation with a farmer who's talking about the frustrations that he had trying to stay on top of his business, um, which is a common theme with other, with other farmers in terms of them saying, yeah, hey, look, Paul, this is tough business. I've got thin margins, revenue that's volatile and depends on X factors I don't control, like commodity prices and weather. And then to boot, I've got these big operating loans to contend with. And so how can I not stay on top of my business when I have a business like that one? The challenge seems to be is like, is the how, right? And the, the common thread there seems to be manual entry, whether it's manual entry in spreadsheets, sell by sell, 
or even in the piece of software that they bought, <laughs> manual entry in there too. And so what we're building is something for the farmers to have that system of record where they can get the great view of what's going on in the farm, manage performance, but not have to do the manual entry. And so for us, that comes with two layers. One layer is the, the field operation side for which we plug into the John Deere Operation Center, AFS Connect, Climate Field View, et cetera, which is not new, that's been done. But what we are doing that's new is, is for that second layer, which is the financials and the transactions component that can be invoices, settlement sheets, scale tickets, receipts, et cetera. We're pulling that in with the image recognition technology. So get the image, pull out what we need to, log the information, and then back it up with the image so that that way the farmer gets a system of record that they're that they're after um, and then we can help them manage performance from then on. So Paul, you mentioned image recognition. You're going to have to explain to farmers how that works. So you take a load of grain into the scale, maybe you've got a receipt from a, a supplier. Talk a little bit about how that technology works. Sure, yeah. So you might analogize it to the way that you do the, the remote capture for checks in your mobile banking platform. You take a picture of the check, the banking platform pulls it in and says, ah, okay, I understand this is from Chad. He's sending X amount of money to Matt from Capital One Bank to the other one. And it all just kind of pulls from that, from that image. So if a farmer wants to learn more about this software and join in on, on your mission of creating this very unique platform, how do they do that, Paul? So our, uh, they can learn more on our website, which is foragersoftware.com. They can also email me at paul at foragersoftware.com. Well, Paul, we certainly appreciate you joining us to give a little insight on maybe a new solution to help farmers with some of the frustrations on keeping track of everything in their business. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. We thank Paul and Chad for sharing that information with us here in our technology segment. We know that you enjoy this part of This Week in Agribusiness each week, and many of you learn something you didn't know before. We hear from you, and we certainly appreciate that, and we thank Chad once more. Well, it's time to continue learning about American agriculture. Charlie Behrens, in partnership with Pivot Biomax, is bringing us another Ag States of America. This time, we're going to Kentucky. The United States of America can be very different from one state to another, but one thing every state has in common is agriculture. Hey everyone, I'm Charlie Behrens and welcome to the Agricultural States of America. We're going to test your knowledge about the agriculture of different states and hopefully give you a little bit of appreciation for all the great things that farmers are producing across America. Now today we're talking about the state that's home to big hats, bourbon, fast horses and mint juleps. And if you put your money on Kentucky, well that horse just won the derby. If you didn't, don't worry, I am here to teach you a little bit more about the bluegrass state. So why is Kentucky named the bluegrass state when the grass is green? Now some say it's because the early settlers saw a bluish tint in the Kentucky pastures. Maybe they did, maybe it was the booze. Either way, the name stuck. Bluegrass is actually a species of grass that's ideal for grazing and is found in many of the pastures across the state. Now you're probably wondering why are pastures so important to Kentuckians? Well, it's because the state's deep appreciation for all things horses. Kentucky is the nation's leading producer of horses, including everything from mules to ponies to purebreds and thoroughbreds. And of course, we can't forget about the Kentucky Derby, the annual horse race in Louisville that takes place on the first Saturday in May and is dubbed the Run for the Roses. It's a beautiful day. A day the entire country gets a pass on wearing seersuckers and floppy hats with flowers. Sometimes wearing them together. When the steeds aren't racing, visitors can tour farms and admire these four-legged athletes and maybe get a hot tip for the Preakness or the Belmont Stakes. And rumor has it those horses even take bribes in the form of carrots and apples. So bring your groceries. And while horses are number one, coming in at a close second are beef cattle. Kentucky raises more beef cattle than any other state east of the Mississippi. 
And of course, we can't forget about pigs, chickens, goats, and sheep. Speaking of sheep, did you know that in Western Kentucky, the traditional meat of pitmasters and barbecue lovers is mutton? Now allow me to clarify, the meat, not the bad beard, with techniques perfected over time and served with a dipping sauce of vinegar and hot peppers, this famous barbecue tradition was born. The state also grows plenty of wheat, soybeans, and corn. It's also important to note that Kentucky is a major player in growing oak trees for lumber. So now let's discuss how corn and lumber relate. And to do that, we gotta talk about bourbon. See, now I piqued your interest. Kentucky produces 95% of the world's supply of bourbon whiskey. In fact, there are more barrels of bourbon being aged in Kentucky than the state has people. As of 2019, that number surged to double the population with more than 9 million barrels in total. That is a two to one ratio in favor of hooch, which is the kind of math I can get behind. For a whiskey to be considered a bourbon though, it has to be made with at least 51% corn and can only be aged in a brand new charred oak barrel. So to be the best bourbon in the world, you need Kentucky, at least according to my extensive uh, research on the issue. Now Kentucky sits on a bed of blue limestone that allows water to flow through and collect minerals that add personality and flavor to the water. Kentucky also has unique weather extremes. It's very hot in the summer, very cold in the winter, which is perfect for bourbon production. When the barrels expand, the whiskey seeps in and absorbs the properties of the charred wood. Then when the temperatures are cold, the barrel contracts and the whiskey is pushed out of the wood, adding flavor and a golden color. You know, I'm not sure why they didn't just teach science in terms of bourbon, but uh, I think I finally understand chemistry. But what about all the used barrels? Well, Kentucky exports them around the world for the production of other spirits like Canadian Scotch, Irish whiskey, Mexican tequila, and even French wine. Who would have ever guessed I'd be jealous of a barrel? Well, that's all the time we have for now, but you can always go to pivotbio.com slash agstates to explore more about the agriculture of your favorite states and test your knowledge to win great prizes and more. All right, we'll see you next time on the Agricultural States of America. Well, our thanks to Charlie Barron's there with another fascinating Ag States of America. Folks, if you want to learn more, you can find them at pivotbio.com slash Ag States. And Max is a good Southern Indiana boy. I bet you've spent some time in Kentucky, haven't you? <laughs> I looked from afar. You know, we'd look over the Ohio River down to the south, growing up in southwestern Indiana. You know, Charlie, I'm sure you, you weren't enlightened too much about bourbon, but I was. I was, I was really impressed with the information that he shared there. Yeah. And of course, at one time, it was a big tobacco producer. There is still tobacco grown in the state of Kentucky. I think about 35,000 acres of burly tobacco still produced there, maybe 10,000 acres of dark cured tobacco. So there is still some production there. At one time, I think it was a $1 billion industry back around wow. 1997. But as has been the case in some other states, we've seen that conversion from tobacco production into other crops and growers are doing very, very well in that post-tobacco era. But uh, it was a great source of pride that it really supported many families for a long time. It certainly did. not you hear that when you talk to folks from Kentucky? Now we're to a point we're seeing these tobacco barns, long a heritage and a site across Kentucky, being converted into vacation rentals for folks to come and experience the culture that way. I think it's fantastic. And Max, I've got to say, I stopped and saw church Downs when I was in Louisville for the Farm Machinery Show. Pretty interesting yeah, to see we'll, there. We'll know where to look for you in May. <laughs> that is true, folks. That's the Ag States of America. You can find more at pivotbio.com slash ag states. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. We're in that run-up to the growing season ahead. Farmers are making those last-minute improvements on equipment. I've talked to growers in recent days who've been out of the shop trying to upgrade those row units to be prepared to do a better job of planting. Absolutely, Max. A lot of folks in Louisville at the National Farm Machinery Show were thinking ahead to this planting season, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, both from the growers and from the exhibitors. We had a chance to catch up with Jake Jass, who's the sales manager at Copperhead Ag, and we talked about that company's recent growth. 
we started uh, with an acquisition out of Illinois. We bought a company called RK Products, and they make gauge wheel arm repair kits, closing wheel frame repair kits, some seed tube guards. Um, so we're just thinking fixing a, a planter row unit, like those kind of kits. Um, and from there we went to actually a harvest product. We brought in concaves for combines. Um, and then most recently, we moved to the front end of the planter. Previously, Copperhead was all kind of the back end um, business of the planter. Now we've moved with the Sunco acquisition last July, we've moved to the front end of the planter. So we're talking about nutrient application, um, saber tooth row cleaners, those kind of products. How does Copperhead identify potential acquisitions? What are you looking for when you're growing the product line here for Copperhead Ag? Certainly, well the number one thing is always the farmer, is, is, is what does the farmer need to, uh, no spring is the same, uh, there's no two uh, crops that are exactly the same, there's no two fields that have the same soil types. So we need to have products that are adjustable, um, high quality, um, made to withstand a wide variety of uh, different conditions. So that's what we're looking for. Basically just keeping that farmer in the forefront of our mind and, and really looking for um, pretty much with all these products we brought on, they're products that had a very ardent following, but not a lot of marketing behind it. And so we're able to take a great product and then just put just a little bit of extra marketing to it and it really makes a big difference. It helps when you can get the word out like that with your existing customer base. And with that being said, Jake, this time of year, we're looking ahead to planning. Farmers are getting geared up. Yeah. What should they be thinking about with regard to Copperhead Ag's products? Sure, well, the nice thing is we've been able to do a good job staying in supply of products. So we do actually have product on the shelf. Now, being that it's February, it's National Farm Machinery Show week, this is our, probably our heaviest season is from here till March 15th. And so I would say if you're gonna order something, it's time to get that order put in. Um, so really timeliness is a big thing that we're thinking about this time of year. That certainly makes sense. And for farmers who do wanna get in touch with Copperhead Egg or look at utilizing some of these products in their operation, how can they get in touch? How do they contact Copperhead or how do your products reach the farmer? You bet. So. That's a great question, how do our products reach the farmer? Uh, we have a great dealership network set up throughout the Midwest um, from basically the Missouri River over to the coast and down into Texas. So um, if you are looking for a Copperhead product, a great thing is to go on the website, hit our dealer locator, put your zip code in there, and you'll see who your neighbor is that can actually partner with you, knows your farm, knows how to work with these products. So that's number one, talk to your local dealer. Um, if you have specific questions that maybe are a little technical, our sales staff is fantastic. We have an 800 number, but it goes to our cell phones. We're great at taking those calls. We love to take them. We like to talk with farmers. Um, so uh, it's the website's the start of that information, right? Copperheadag.com, dealer locators, cell phone numbers, and obviously there's product pictures and video and all that on there as well. That was Jake Jass, sales manager at Copperhead Ag. And a great reminder, folks, we are getting closer and closer to planting season. If you've got needs on your operation, it's time now to get those filled and get things squared away so you're ready to roll when that time comes. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, as we take a look at the weather, we look toward the western part of the country, and Greg, I know the Sierra Nevada snowpack yep. sure has been improved. Yeah, that's Maybe right. Maybe there's some more coming along? Absolutely. Uh, this week, this uh, very hyperactive weather pattern, no less than three separate streams, jet stream uh, pockets of air up aloft, driving the atmospheric engine just about all across North America. Uh, the main polar branch continuing to make its presence felt into the Pacific Northwest. We get these chunks of Arctic air to drop southward. Yeah, 30 to 35 degree below zero cold last week, uh, just north of the border. Not, uh, of course, exclusive to that. The uh, wind and the blizzard, and certainly hope you made it through A-OK -okay across the Dakotas and points on east. One week, you melt away that snow with the Chinook down, flow, down slope flow, and then the next week, you generate uh, severe weather, winter time style. And there's more moisture, too, into areas of the Cascades and northern Sierra with one weather system moving on through. It's a very persistent northwest 
to southeast digging jet stream pattern and another winter weather system winding up on the periphery of Arctic air here. Colder air down south and the cold air dump as well into the northern and central valleys of California. How about those southern ranges outside of LA blizzard warnings last week and who knows maybe more snow as far south as the southern Sierra and into the areas of northern Arizona and New Mexico with one, two, three weather systems on the move uh, and we're making some modest drought improvement to still some of the worst areas from Nebraska on southward. It's coming at a price winter storm style, but again, it is moisture. Another feature on shore with uh, more shower activity, Southern California, desert southwest and into the central and southern plains with late season snows to the north and farther south into Texas. Showers and thunderstorms max last week, 85 mile an hour winds into that. parts of New Mexico and visibility is down under a mile with blowing dust in West Texas. Yeah, and that snow in the northern part of the country, that was just part of the story because you did have driving winds with it with blizzard conditions. Exactly, and it just takes a couple of inches to get that blizzard look and feel, but it was more like 20, 25, almost 30 inches of snow, roughly from Watertown to just north of the Twins to Lambeau and Green Bay and points on northward, and we're not done with the winter weather pattern whatsoever. Again, the periphery of Arctic air here, Gulf moisture and this unusual warmth that generated severe weather in the central and southern parts of Illinois and Indiana last week. So there's more rain in the forecast. Now we're keeping eye on streams and rivers into areas of the central Corn Belt. And one weather system blows on by with a little rain snow mix and another one on its heels with very cold air up to the north. Uh, bitter cold through big sky country and organized moisture across the heart of the Corn Belt. And again, back into the central plains with additional, despite the snow, drought relief forecast for parts of western Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. Uh, quiet weather pattern into parts of the southern plains, but it's windy and colder. Weather system across old Mexico. Showers and thunderstorms over the southeastern part of the country. How about the bud swell and the early development down there of uh, fruit trees? We're keeping an eye on that because of late season cold, uh, but there's more moisture and warmth ahead with showers and thunderstorms getting too wet for early season field work over the Delta region up to the north. Uh, maybe a rain snow mix back into play for Oklahoma and Texas and more wind in the desert southwest. It looked like it wasn't too bad in Syracuse for the New York Farm Show. Our friend Scotty Grigger there was welcoming folks in for that big event, I think in six different buildings at the fairgrounds. Uh, and it was a busy weather pattern just after that in areas to the north through northern New England. Matter of fact, that western storm at one point ran from Montana and the divide through the northern plains all the way into the northeast of New England. But it's a quiet picture here early in the week. Another warm up for the uh, southern Corn Belt and a widespread swath of rain to uh, freezing rain to showers and thunderstorms to organized snows with much colder air building back in into the western Great Lakes region and another disturbance out of the Ozark Plateau will run through the I-70 corridor. Another round of rain, some mixed snow and beneficial moisture for the northeast of New England on top of the recent snow into the northeast and New England. Meanwhile, over the southern states, again, a record setting warmth over the past couple of weeks. That trend continues Gulf Coast and through Florida. Summertime heat. Yeah, in the Atlantic, the hot ridge in contrast to that cold air up to the north. So it's an active weather pattern along this jet stream with one frontal system on the move. Later in the week, additional showers and thunderstorms heavy and severe in the lower Mississippi Valley. Greg Sodia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. There was a lot of beneficial moisture in the past week. It appears there could be more in the week ahead. Some folks may be getting a little bit too much of a good thing here, Greg. Yeah, that's right. It applies to especially the Corn Belt locales, eastern sections. We have really just about, with the exception of parts of Michigan, small areas of the southern Great Lakes region, really eradicated the drought uh, across the eastern Corn Belt. Same with much of the eastern half of the United States, except for parts of the eastern Carolinas down through Georgia. Uh, Maine drought areas continue on in western Iowa, Nebraska, on southward, but again, little by little, we're making an improvement. May come at a price again this week with a look at the rain snow line dip here. Uh, yeah, some rain to freezing rain to snow. That scenario plays out again throughout much of the Corn Belt into the plains up to the I-70 corridor down through Texas and points out to the east. Showers and thunderstorms an inch or two or more heavy and severe in the Pacific Northwest. It starts this way to maybe as much as six inches in the mountains and then uh, transcends down across the areas of California, the southwest 
southwest. So this moisture pattern here into the southwest later on in the week. So virtually everyone, Max, gets moisture in one form or another this week. That's rather impressive. All right, let's look at the week of March 6th. How do you see the temperatures? Uh, temperatures across the country are in this uh, very compact setup with warmth and almost summer-like warmth in some areas of the southeast. The warmth to about the mid-Missouri Valley into southeastern Canada. Look at the sharp change to colder weather and much colder conditions from the divide back into the Pacific Northwest. It serves up this particular weather system. Really little change with the exception. The atmosphere is warming. It's beginning to cap off in the southeastern states. This is fairly good news uh, with rains that have been quite heavy of late. Anyway, beneficial moisture. California, Pacific Northwest. More drought relief, but again, livestock managers heads up uh, late season snows. That moisture pattern to the northeast of New England. More severe weather potential. Southern Plains into the Ohio Valley. You've referenced these big temperature contrasts. Uh, will that continue into the week of March 13th? It certainly will. And look at this uh, temperature pattern right. here with almost uh, maybe uh, early summer like warm pushing 90 in the areas of the southeastern states back and through Texas uh, above average here all the way up uh, to about the I-80 corridor. Once again, a tight compaction. You go within a few hours drive last week. You had about a 30 to 50 degree temperature swing. Probably the same story here. Look at the cold air over the heavy snowpack through southern Canada. Once again, very busy weather pattern, more drought relief, northern California, Pacific Northwest, late season snows to the upper Midwest, far northern Corn Belt, more severe weather and heavy rainfall for parts of the central Corn Belt back into the southern plains, drying out over the southeastern part of the country. Yeah, but you have those contrasts, especially this time of the year, I think of severe weather. The week of March 20th, as we get into spring, well, what do you see there? We see just that could be a very busy, severe weather season. The cold air locked in position. This is a snapshot here, probably well into uh, the remainder of uh, March, if not April, and the start of planting season across the Corn Belt. Warmth over the southern United States. There's the cold air. There's the dip in the jet stream pattern across the heartland. So once again, systems in across the Pacific Northwest. They energize over the central plains, swing out into the northeast of New England. Late season snows here through the upper Midwest, Pacific Northwest, more severe weather potential. Southern Corn Belt into the southeastern states. Probably again, the pattern that will play out here as we get in through April and May. It looks to be a busy and wet season across the heartland. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Every now and then I'm sent a great set of tractor restoration pictures that really point out the job that it is to restore one of those old machines. I share with you one, uh, it eventually became a blue one, a blue tractor, Max's Tractor Shed, brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. With the help of Mystic Lubes, you can keep your machines working harder for longer. Season after season, Mystic Lubricants made to make it last. Well, John Voss, who lives near Kansas City, Missouri, has a lot of pride in the heritage of his family going back in the agriculture industry. I believe he told me both his grandfathers farmed with Ford tractors. Well, somewhere in that Council Bluffs, Iowa area, John found this Ford that he's in the midst of restoring, a 1975 Ford 7000. He told me that after he attended the half century of progress in Illinois two shows ago, the one in 2019, it became his goal to restore a tractor and display it at the show. The view of that newly painted 7000 before many parts and sheet metal were added has a beauty of its own, I think, and a reminder of the hard work it is to restore a tractor. We look forward to seeing this, hopefully, at the half century of progress coming up in August, this blue Ford 7000 from Greenwood, Missouri. Well, he doesn't just sell old farm equipment or new farm equipment or construction equipment. He sells land. Here's Mark Stock. Well, Max, the real estate market's still hot all across the country. And next week in Illinois, you'll have your chance to buy several properties on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Check out the quality offerings, including the 1,029 acre parcel selling in Knox in Scotland County, Missouri in six different tracks on Friday, March the 3rd. And March the 1st, folks, on the BigIron.com website, Dennis Cook Estate Auction, Features a lot of quality equipment, including a 2020 John Deere MX-8 pull-type shredder. They have a 2014 Case IHWD-1203 windrower and a very super sharp John Deere 4255 power shift tractor with only 4,800 hours. 
Neenheiser Farms in Sydney, Nebraska will sell 118 items and an item selling in Panora, Iowa is receiving a lot of attention. An Artsway 475 grinder mixer selling for Adam Benner. On March 1st, you'll see 31 planters selling, 38 tractors and late model construction equipment like a 2014 Caterpillar 140M2 VHP motor grader. All selling on BigIron.com and Sullivan Auctioneers next week. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Now it's time to check in with that next generation of ag leadership. This week, we're meeting Madeline Klutz. She is currently serving as the vice president of the North Carolina State FFA. Madeline, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Think back and tell me what was it that prompted you to want to be a part of FFA in the first place? So my beginning with FFA began in the agricultural classroom. I actually ended up having a family member serve as my FFA advisor, so he really pushed me to be more involved and to get hands-on with some of the things I enjoyed. I started my days off in the greenhouse just outside of our school building and fell in love. I wanted to be in there every second of every day, and he assured me that that was only the beginning of FFA. He began and, to introduce me to many different things, and I was just so excited to be there and take part in everything. That is fantastic. It's amazing how it can get into your blood. And Madeline, then, of course, you decided to move into leadership. And what was it about FFA that made you want to be a leader? So well, I had a plenty of people before me who served as leaders, both on the state and regional level. And they really just inspired me each day to be able to reach out to more members. I saw that they were able to reach members from the beaches to the mountains in North Carolina, and it just made me so excited to be able to meet so many different people with so many different backgrounds and learn from them. That's so true. North Carolina is an incredibly diverse state, agriculturally speaking. So to that end, as you look out to the remainder of your term as vice president, Madeline, what are you excited about? I'm super excited to finish up visiting some of those chapters that I haven't been able to visit yet. Um, we've done a lot on the eastern part of the state, not quite to the beach yet, um, but I'm looking forward to going there uh, soon and then also in the mountains region. So I'm actually from more of the center part of the state. So I'm excited to continue that venture on, uh, meet with more students and see what they're doing in their FFA chapters and see how we can best uh, help them. That is fantastic, Madeline Klutz. We certainly wish you the best as you continue this trek as your FFA Vice President for the state of North Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck in the future in your career. Well, fertilizer availability and costs are not quite the concern they were a year ago, to be sure, but growers still want to make the most of that nutrient investment, don't they? They absolutely do, Max. And fertilizer companies want to find ways to unlock more value in that fertilizer, period. And I had the chance to talk with Matt Souter. He's the director of global agronomy at Mosaic Biologicals, and I asked him how Mosaic is planning to become a leader in that space. Mosaic has uh, long been the leader in balanced crop nutrition and providing uh, information and, and uh, uh, excellence in, in supporting season-long nutrition. What we look to see is a movement towards advanced crop nutrition where we can improve nutrient use efficiency and other crop dynamics through the use of things like biological products. Biopath and PowerCoat are both live bacillus species bacterial products that are applied either through your uh, UAN, Biopath is a water-based liquid formulation that's applied through UAN or liquid fertilizers. And uh, PowerCoat is actually an oil-based product that's a, used to impregnate dry fertilizers. So both are, are uh, significantly uh, tested and proven as products in the field, and they do provide improvements in nutrient use efficiency. Now, the Mosaic Company, of course, is a fertilizer company. Matt, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between fertilizers and biologicals? Well, well the fact is that, that fertilizers specifically in any given year often only have 20 to 60 percent of the fertilizer taken up in that same year. And it, this, is, this is not specific to a single fertilizer. It's across the spectrum. So what we're trying to do is use biology and use native species from the soil to actually improve the nutrient use efficiency by improving availability, 
by improving uptake and enabling utilization of those nutrients that were previously maybe less available. Matt, as growers are learning more about biologicals, I'm curious about timing. Is there an application time that makes more sense for these type of products? It, absolutely there is, Mike. Great question. The reality is that as we try and influence uh, yield uh, components of, of any given crop, we want to apply at a point where we can influence the overall yield potential. And so our products are specifically designed uh, to go out when the fertilizer goes out. And typically those fertilizer applications occur at a time to influence the overall yield potential. In the case of Biopath, it goes out in a liquid formulation with UAN typically at side dress. And in the case of Power Coat, we see it impregnated on dry fertilizer. And that's often in a pre-plant application. The reason for that specifically, for example, in corn is that if you influence that crop prior to V6, you have the opportunity to influence the ear size uh, as it develops in that corn crop. Matt, I'm curious, before we let you go, about availability looking ahead to this next year. Will these products be available to growers and easy to uh, get their hands on? Absolutely. There is plenty of availability and we have a great body of evidence. The best place if growers want to learn more about the products is probably to visit CropNutrition.com or they can go to CornSprint.com to sign up for a free kit. That was Matt Souter, Director of Global Agronomy with Mosaic Biologicals. Max, it's hard to believe we're coming up on Commodity Classic 2023 soon, right? Oh, it's going to be in Orlando, Florida in just a few days. I know you'll be there doing your radio show. We sure will be broadcasting from the Trello Board booth Thursday and Friday. I'll be at Case IH. We'll trade some farm all stories Absolutely. with friends there as well. We hope you'll be with us right here next week for This Week in Agribusiness. Till then, so long. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.